PhotoShelter is the leader in online portfolio websites and tools for professional photographers. We help you get business, do business, and keep business. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar, Telling Stories in Your Portraits, Environmental Lighting Tips with our friend, Tony Gale. Thanks so much for joining us, Tony. We're excited Thank to you. have you. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, First of all, I, my name is Amy Fitzgibbons. I'm the marketing director here at Photo Shelter. And uh, just to do a few housekeeping items before we get going, I wanted to let everyone know that we've got a partner, a great partner for this webinar, Manfrotto, and uh, the Manfrotto Lighting. And they have offered up uh, a nice offer for everyone who's listening in, and that is to get free shipping on all items from manfrotto.us using the code FREESHIP14. So you can see it there on the, on the screen, write it down, use it, order some great stuff for them. And then Tony has another giveaway for us. For those who are attending the Photo Plus Expo in a couple of weeks here in New York, uh, Tony will be, uh, will be teaching along with Lindsay Adler and a few other folks at PDN's University on the 29th, which I believe is Wednesday. Is that right, Tony? That is correct. All right. And uh, Tony will be giving away two passes to that. So what we just ask everyone to do is give a shout out uh, to at Photo Shelter and or at Tony Gale before the end of the webinar on Twitter and we will pick some lucky winners to announce by the very end. Um, also, and we, we don't have this on here, but I wanted to offer folks who are not Photo Shelter members up with a special discount for 30 days free. And all you have to do is go to photoshelter.com and put in the code get started, all one word, so that's G-E-T-S-T-A-R-T-E-D. One word, and uh, you'll get yourself an extra two weeks to try us out. So, to get started, I want to introduce Tony. Uh, Tony is a photographer, a friend of Photo Shelter for a long time now, based here in New York uh, since 2000, originally from the opposite coast, in the opposite corner of the country, Washington State. He's uh, a Manfrotto ambassador, also uh, works a bunch with uh, the Sony Artisan of Imagery program, he teaches photographic lighting at FIT and uh, has also taught at SVA and several other schools, as well as uh, leading workshops for APA and others. And I've actually been to one of Tony's lighting workshops, and they're a lot of fun. So I'm excited to get started today. Uh, he shoots for a range of companies, editorial uh, photography, including Bank of America, State Farm, Best Buy, New York Moves Magazine, and tons more. And fun fact about Tony is that he is a dedicated runner. And by dedicated, I mean triathlete, marathons, half marathons, you name it, Tony's done it. So uh, as we go along here, if you have any running questions for Tony, you know, just toss them out. Um, but uh, if not, toss out your, uh, your lighting questions. I'm going to hand it over to Tony. But as you have questions, feel free to tweet us, again, at PhotoShelter. And uh, we'll try to jump in and ask him and get those answered. So without uh, spending any more time, I'm going to hand it over to you, Tony. All right, great. Uh, like uh, Amy said, please send in any questions you have. Uh, and I will start talking about some lighting. Uh, so this first picture is a, a gentleman named Austin McCormick. He's the artistic director of a theatrical dance group called Company 14. Um, and I photographed him for a project, a personal project on interesting people. He was suggested by uh, somebody he worked with. Um, and as you can see, it's, he's lit by those fluorescent lights along the wall. When I went to uh, the theater that he was producing a play and they were doing rehearsals and I went there to photograph him and I brought some lights. Um, but in looking around, I really liked this spot. I liked the, the graphic imagery of it. Uh, Amy, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, so, in looking around, like I said, I, I was looking for this. I saw the fluorescent lights on the wall, and the interesting thing about fluorescent lights is because they're so long, they give a really interesting quality of light. It's not, it's not as hard as you would think of something that small. Um, 
and it's it's a different it's just a different feel the color can be all over the place obviously fluorescents are all over the map but for this I, I thought it was very interesting and then you can see that tungsten light in the background that theatrical light back there so in looking around I found this wall I had him get close enough so I could see the way that the light uh, hit his face and hit his body and normally you wouldn't want to underlight somebody but for this especially with the tilt of his head uh, it really worked I felt like uh, it, you know it was a little bit of a long exposure 80th of a second at 3.5 but really not bad ISO 250 it I think it has a lot of personality and it shows that you don't always have to light. I usually think bringing artificial lights is better. It's almost always gives you a better quality of light, but sometimes what's there is better than anything you could think of. Uh, okay, let's let's go to the next one. That was an easy one. All right, this is Julie Chu. Julie Chu is a four-time Olympian. She's on the US women's hockey team. Three silvers and a bronze medal. Uh, and when I photographed her, she had the three of the medals because the fourth one was after this photo shoot. And I got to hold Olympic medals, which made me a little nervous. I was afraid I would drop them. They're very heavy, heavier than you would think, uh, but very cool. So this, this shoot was an assignment, uh, and part of the assignment was to potentially shoot her juggling, which is bouncing a field hockey ball on the end of that hockey stick. So with that in mind, it affected how I chose to light it. Uh, normally I would use strobes, but in this instance, knowing that I might do some motion as well, obviously strobes won't work. Uh, by motion, I mean video. So I brought fluorescent banks. Uh, I have these inexpensive fluorescent banks that compromises, the color isn't great. Um, and we set those up. This is a house up in Boston. And I had a, I set up two fluorescent banks to the right. If you want to go to the next slide, Amy. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, two fluorescent banks to the right, so that it's that nice soft light. They're about two by three feet each, so they're fairly soft. And if you put two of them together, it really creates a nice wall of light, and then it bounces off the the wall. You can see to fill it in. Um, and this, again, was a little bit of a long exposure, a 60th of a second, not terribly long, but 2.8 because they wanted a very shallow depth of field. Uh, that would have been difficult as well with strobe because uh, the power is just too much. It's very hard to get uh, down to 2.8 with strobes. It's just, it's just too much juice. But for this, it worked really well. Um, we tried moving the lights a little bit forward, but that contrast on her face, that gradation, that quality of light that you get really worked well with the side lighting and it it worked fantastically and then of course the client did want us to shoot video so it was just as simple as switching the camera from stills to video uh, and shooting shooting her juggling which was pretty impressive because there's no way that I could bounce a field hockey ball on the end of a hockey stick. Um, so Tony, is uh, are you also balancing the natural light uh, in this room as well? You know, there is that window there, and there was a little natural light, but there was so little that it really barely mattered. Okay. Um, if you look at the shadow side of her face, you know that's fill and natural light, and it's quite a bit darker. Mm -hmm. So there is some natural light, but it it's so minor that it it really didn't matter so much. All of the light you can see except the highlights in the edge of that window that you can see in the top uh, is pretty much all the fluorescent banks. Got it. And what made you decide on this particular location? Was that the assignment to shoot indoor, make it look like a home, or was this just a really nice spot that, that you decided to choose? Um, this was a situation where it's really great when you have a client and a producer and a whole team uh, because they picked everything. They had this, this enormous house up outside Boston. Um, the client wanted a fairly simple background but something that looked like a place. So we did other shots in a kitchen. I did shots of her on white in a garage. But for this, it was going to be a web ad and very horizontal, so we needed 
a, a fairly horizontal shot and they need to be fairly simple because with a web ad they want the image when it's compressed to be as small as possible and that doesn't work with a complicated background. Right. So that's why it was this particular spot. Got uh, it. But it was great. It, you go there, somebody's already dressed everything, you've got a whole team. You say, I need this stuff moved, I think we need a different pillow. Let's close those blinds and you have a crew that just rushes in and handles it for you. I wish every shoot was like that. Right. And what kind of, I mean, had you pre-planned the type of lights you were bringing or do you bring multiple lights to a shoot like this and, and try a bunch out? Uh, for this, I did have multiple lights, but because of the conversation I had ahead of time with the client where they had told me they might want a little bit of video shot, I had planned on the fluorescent banks. Uh, prior to that conversation, I wouldn't even have brought them. I would have only brought strobe. Right. And for the other shots, like the shots we did on, on white in the garage, that was all strobe. Got it. But it was, it was pre-planned for things that involve clients, uh, especially advertising clients like this was, you have to at least have some idea of what you're doing ahead of time because there's a layout, there's things that they need to have and if you're just winging it, uh, you, you risk the possibility that you're not going to be able to deliver what they need. Right. Uh, all right, let's go to the all next right. one. Jump up. All right, this is an actress named London Vale in L.A. Uh, I wish we got light like that in New York. That's in the Hollywood Hills up off of Mulholland Drive. Um, and this was an example of sort of contrary to what I just said. This was me just wanting to shoot in L.A. I was in L.A. for possibly one of the APA training programs. And any time I travel, if I have time, I like to find people to photograph there just because why not? It's, it's a new location, it's a new place, and you get to try new things. You know, something like this, you know, here in New York, it would be great to be able to do something like that, but it would be, you don't have the plants like that, the light is different, it just doesn't, it doesn't lend itself to that, so it's great to take the opportunity when you're anywhere new to really uh, Yeah, try something experiment. new and, yes. yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I found London Vale. I think there's online casting sites. This one was probably casting networks. Uh, and, you know, she responded in it and it worked out. So let's go to the, the next slide. So uh, before I forget, I would like to mention too that these lighting diagram icons uh, I got from a gentleman named Kevin Kurtz, who has a website, kevinkurtz.com, where you can download this tool that you upload into. Photoshop and it has all of these little icons pre-built that you can just drag in. Uh, and he was kind enough to let me use it for this. Uh, otherwise, otherwise they just wouldn't be as pretty. Uh, so actually, Tony, um, speaking of tools, we're getting a bunch of questions maybe before we dive into the setup here about uh, white balance. Sure. And how, how you balance that, especially for the fluorescence in the last image. Uh, do you use a gray card, color passport? What's, what's your, what are your tips on that front? That is an excellent question and very important. Uh, what I use is the X-Rite Color Checker Passport Pro. Um, it's a small color checker. It's got a, a whole Macbeth gray, uh, gray, Macbeth gray tag color chart. And it's got software that comes with it that allows you to build a profile specific to your lighting and camera. Oh, and cool. It's, it's incredible. It's one of my favorite things that exists in the world. Um, and with that, you've got the gray card. And if you want to just go simple, you can just click on the little gray patch when you're processing. Uh, but you can also build a profile. And there are colors that whatever camera you shoot with, they all have things that they're more and less sensitive to. But with the profile, it knows exactly what color everything's supposed to be and so it will correct it. It's like a printer profile or a monitor profile. You know, the color calibration and the color management in digital photography is really important. And with that tool, it's, it takes it to a whole nother level. I have a catalog client that I shoot with and they have these high vis yellow vests that are really hard to photograph and with the passport, it 
it gets so much better than anything that they've ever had. They're extremely, extremely happy about it. So that's that's the tool I use, and I would encourage everybody to use a gray card. The students I have at FIT, I tell them all the time. They don't always listen, but they should. Um, <laughs> and, every, and everybody listening, every time I don't shoot with a gray card and come back and start processing, and there's some cast that you can't quite identify. It might be a little green, but maybe not that green, or there's some magenta. It really complicates it. And if you have a gray card, especially the uh, color checker passport where you can just click and make it work, it's it's unbelievable. It will help your workflow immensely. All right. Great. Thanks for that. You want to jump into this setup? All right. So this setup was very easy. I had brought strobes with me for this as well. I had a, a battery strobe. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but because of that backlight, uh, I didn't use it. It's, again, only daylight. You can see the sun in the shot and all the flare. It's, it's very Instagram-y now, but this was done in camera with a real camera. Um, and it's with shots like this, what you have to really be careful about is where you put the sun, and you have to pay attention both to your lens, to what filters are on your camera. Uh, if you have filters on there, you're going to get more flare, typically. And depending on your lens and the coatings, you're going to get more or less flare. So you have to experiment a little. But it can work wonders. It can be really beautiful. I think the color on this is beautiful. I like the flare uh, and the position of the flare. But you have to try moving around, put the sun here, put the sun there, show more of it, show less of it. And it also, I find, is much more successful when you are putting that light source, the sun, or whatever else is causing the flare, actually in frame. When it's out of frame and you just get flare, it's a little hard to tell what it is, and it, it can make it a little distracting. It could just make it feel soft. But by seeing the light source, it, it adds a whole other level to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you're going to find that if you use different apertures, the effect you're going to get is different because the size of the aperture affects the way that the flare reacts. So this is wide open at f4 in an 80th of a second. Um, and that gives you those nice, big, sort of flary balls of, of wonderful goodness. Great. Um, all right, let's, let's go to the next one. <laughs> So this is at one of the uh, assistant training workshops we did. This is in Denver, Colorado. This is one of the attendees in the workshop. Um, I don't remember his name. He was very nice. I remember that. If by some chance he's listening, he can send in his name and I'll, and I'll mention it. <laughs> uh, I tried to find it and, and I couldn't. Um, but this is an example of we're outside but we're still using light. Uh, so the last shot, I was outside. I used the sun. Sometimes that works great. This was the middle of the day. If we were trying to use just plain sun in the middle of the day here, the light would be awful. There's always exceptions, but in general, it's going to be awful. In this instance, I think I really like the light. I think it adds a, another layer of, of interest to it. So if we go to the next one, So you can tell from the exposure, we have an ambient of about 1 25th of a second at f11 at ISO 100. So it was just shy of sunny 16. It was a slight overcast. Sunny 16, for those people who don't know, is the shortcut for exposure. If it's 100 ISO and full sun, it's f16 at 1 25th, pretty much. So knowing that, I have a medium softbox on the left that's at f16. Uh, I have a bare head on the right, a bare head meaning it had a reflector but no other modifier on the right at f22. So you can see uh, on our right, his left, that the highlights are brighter than the normal exposure, which was f16 at a 60th, just a little bit, a little bit more than a stop uh, down from what the ambient would have been. So if there had been no strobe, he would have looked dark so that our strobe is overpowering the sun. Uh, and so we're getting that nice highlight from the right. We're getting that fill from the front with the softbox. It's lighting the, the bushes behind him. The ones in the front are a little bit dark because they're mostly just getting sunlight, 
rather than hitting our stroke. And it gives a very, I think, flattering look to his face. It makes him look rugged and tough. He has a great expression. Um, now, how are you adjusting? I'm, I'm going to point out the fact that he has no hair on his head. <laughs> he does have uh, a little, a little hair little on bit, the sides. A little bit on the sides there. But how are you adjusting the the lighting from a from a, re a reflective standpoint, and also with his glasses, obviously? So with his glasses, um, you're you have the the rule of uh, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So mm -hmm. depending on how curved the glasses are and the angle of the lights, you can control that. If, if they're glasses that are fairly fairly flat on the front, you, it's much easier. If they're very curved, it's a lot more complicated. Um, so you just move the lights or change the angle of his head to control that reflection. Right. If, if, uh, if the strobe were directly behind me, there would have been a lot of reflection in his glasses. Uh, but because it's to the left, whatever reflection there is is bouncing off in a direction that I don't see. Got it. If he turned his head a little, we would start seeing reflection again. So, you know, it's something you have to be aware of. You have to keep in mind. Uh, sometimes if you have people slide the glasses down their nose a little or just change the angle of their head, you can control for that. If they have massive curved glasses, then you're just sad sometimes. <laughs> You're out of luck. Uh, well, there's always a way, but it's a lot more work. Right. Um, and then the light on the right is so far to the right that it's not an impact. Uh, and then because I'm using a soft light, the soft box on the front, mm -hmm. it's a little less specular. So there is a little bit of a highlight on his head, but it's not bad. Right. If it was a harder light, it would make that highlight m more specular. Mm -hmm. And that's where you start running into issues with, with people with limited hair. Right. And we've got a, a question. When you're doing these shoots, uh, how frequently are you using a tripod versus just hand-holding your, your camera? That depends on the shoot. Um, I do use tripods quite a bit. This particular one I wasn't, but I'd say 50-50 or 60-40. It depends on what exposure I'm using, uh, how the shot is being composed. So the, the photograph of Julie Chu, for example, that one was on a tripod partly because I knew that there might be retouching involved. And any time there's retouching that might involve compositing, I'm on a tripod always. Because in those instances, anything that moves really complicates the job of the retoucher, whether it's me or in that case, you know, I hired a retoucher. Um, it really makes it easier if things don't move. As soon as stuff moves and things aren't in registration, it, it adds a whole layer of complexity that adds a whole lot of money to the issue, to the job, and that's not necessarily acceptable to anybody. Right. Uh, in this instance, there was no tripod. There are shots later on that did have a tripod, uh, but that's sort of the idea. It's, it's also, if you're shooting all day, it's nice to have a tripod because your arm gets tired. I was shooting earlier this afternoon and I wished I brought my tripod because my arm started getting sore from holding the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, Some practical reasons to have a tripod. There are lots of practical reasons to have a tripod. The tripod I'm using now is I have a Manfrotto uh, carbon fiber 055, which is really nice because it's light but sturdy and absorbs vibration really well because of the carbon fiber. And it's four sections, so it collapses to be very, very small. All right. All right. All right. All right. So this is a guy named Joshua Dean. He is an aerialist, which you could probably guess from the fact that he's in midair on this rope. Uh, I photographed him at the Trapeze School of New York, which I don't know where it is now because where it was when I photographed him, it is no longer. It was a giant, giant white tent. Uh, and he now is at a place called the Two Ring Circus that I guess he co-founded. So he is about, I think he's about nine or 10 feet off the ground. So I'm balanced a little precariously on a step ladder that wasn't quite high enough. So don't, don't do what I did and go higher than you're supposed to. But I did, don't, don't tell OSHA or somebody. Um, so I balanced a little precariously on this tripod, or on, I'm sorry, on this ladder. 
And this is a combination of strobe and daylight. So if we go to the next slide, so it's only one light in here. We're, we were basically in a giant white tent, as you can see, because it's white. So it let in a lot of daylight, but it was not enough. It was too dark, and it was a little top lit, so the light wasn't that flattering. So what we have here is I just bounced one monolight off of the white tent. So it becomes this really soft source from the left. You know, as, as a light source gets bigger, it gets softer. And by bouncing it off of a giant white source, it gets extremely soft. So it wraps around really well. There's some contrast, but it's, it's not too contrasty. And it's, it's a very flattering light. And then balancing the daylight, which was about 125th of a second at f2.8 at ISO 200. And then I shot at 4.5. So you can see it was, you know, a stop and a half, stop and a third brighter on the strobe than the daylight. Although you can see the little rectangular patches in the back that are a little bit brighter. Those are seeing a little bit more outside where it was quite a bit brighter. Uh, but this is an example you would look in and you would think, oh, it's plenty of light. It's, it's daylit. It's white. It's going to be fine. But 125th at 2.8 is pretty dark. Uh, and as I said, it was too top lit. It just, it just wasn't flattering. So that little bit of light, that monolight, really helped tremendously. So, uh, it, Tony, how are you mat matching the strobe light temperature to the sunlight in this so, case? So daylight and strobe are pretty close to the same, depending on, on several things. If, if it's the middle of the day and you're using strobe, they're pretty close to the same. If it's overcast outside, it's a little cooler than strobe. If you're in shade, it's much cooler than strobe. And then depending on what you're putting on the strobe, it affects the color. If you're putting a very old softbox on there that's turned yellow, it's going to be warm. Uh, in this instance, it matched very well because I was bouncing a monolight off of a white, a pretty white wall. It was a little bit warm, uh, but just a little. And because it was the main light source, instead of trying to match it exactly because the strobe was brighter, you don't really see it. I mean, the shot's a little warm because I like it a little warm, but the fact that it was a little warmer than the daylight uh, didn't have a negative impact on the color in this instance. If it was balanced exactly, you might see part of it being warm and part of it being cool, but by making one or the other brighter, you minimize that. And of course, use a great card. Always use a great card. If you learn one thing today. That's right. Always use a great card. And my favorite <laughs> is the X-Rite Color Checker Passport. <laughs> All right, moving on. All right, so this is Miranda Beverly Whitmore, who's a writer in Brooklyn. Uh, it's one of the very rare shoots that is walking distance from my apartment in Brooklyn, which is not quite as good as it sounds because all my equipment is at my office in the city in Manhattan. But, but still, it's nice. It's fun to shoot in Brooklyn. So this was a shoot for Poets and Writers magazine, uh, which is a magazine about poets and writers. And this is her apartment in Brooklyn. So when I was hired to do this shoot, I didn't know much. They told me the name of her, so I, of the writer, so I looked her up to see what she looked like. Anytime, especially with editorial, if I know who I'm photographing, I will look it up because it gives me some idea of what I'm getting into. If if uh, I'm going to have to do something special because of whatever, if, if they are the person that has giant Coke bottle glasses, I'd like to know ahead of time. If they're bald, I'd like to know ahead of time. If they're Anything unusual, it's helpful to have as much information as you can going in. And now that we have the internet and Google, it's pretty easy. Uh, so the magazine told me that they probably wanted a horizontal because it was potentially going to be a two-page spread. You have to be a little careful with that, that you keep the gutter clear, which means that the middle of the frame, you don't want anything important in the middle of the frame because that's where the two pages are going to meet and it gets lost in that spot. So she's to the left of the middle. Uh, so we went to her house in Brooklyn. It's a nice brownstone. Um, and walked through the whole house with the editor. Uh, 
and the, they, both the editor and the designer were on the shoot. And so the designer and I walked through the house. We looked at each room. We ended up shooting in this room. We shot in uh, another room, and we shot in her office. But this was the shot that they ended up using and the shot that I liked the best. And this is an example where the color checker passport is fantastic. Because if we go to the next slide, you can see I've just bounced two monolites off the wall behind me. And if you look at the wall behind her, you can see that it's yellow. So if you bounce a white light off a yellow wall, you have a yellow light. And that's fine if you can correct it later, which you can if you have a gray card. If it was just auto white or eyeballing it, it gets really complicated in a situation like this because you're looking at the wall and you don't know what color of yellow it was. It was it white? Are you trying to make that wall white? Uh, it really, really gets to be not so fun. Um, and in this, I tried a few things too. I ended up bouncing the two lights off the wall behind me, but I started out with uh, a really large umbrella to the right, and then a, a softbox on the left to fill, but that was too contrasty. You can also tell that there are two uh, mirrors behind her. You can see a lamp and a dresser reflected in one. So that impacted where I could put lights, and then the mirror to her left impacted where I could put lights. Because again, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, you have to really be careful of that. Uh, so with the umbrella and the softbox that I tried at first, the places that those were the most flattering were also in my shot. And admittedly, you can retouch that out if you want to, but anything you can do in camera is better than what you can do in post. So I started out with one monolite. The first one was just to the right of camera. And that was in the ballpark, but it was still a little too contrasty. So that's when I added the second one to the left of camera. It just became a giant wall of soft light. And then... And Tony, how did you get the detail? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to ask how you got the detail in the window there, outside. Uh, that's a great thing with strobe, is you can balance strobe and daylight uh, interiors and exteriors by just changing the power of your strobe. It was an overcast day outside, so it wasn't super bright. I mean, you can see my exposure was a 60th of a second at f5 at ISO 100. So, you know, that's not that bright. But if I were using something other than strobe, either the outside would have been too bright or it would have been too dark, unless I just got completely lucky. Uh, but in this instance, <clears throat> I wanted a little bit of tone. I didn't want it to draw too much attention to it. So I was able to balance it by just changing the power of the strobe to get me what I needed. And how close are the strobes to the wall that you're bouncing off of? They were a foot and a half, two feet. Okay. So close, not super close, but pretty close. Enough that it spreads out and it's soft, but not so much that it's blasting everything. If they'd been further away, you would have started seeing what they were hitting in these two mirrors and possibly in the window as well. And you've got to be dealing with some space constraints, especially in a, a New York apartment, too. Yeah, this room was a lot smaller than it looks. It, yeah. was, it, was, it was tight. Nobody could really move much once the lights were there. I think that the designer was sort of crouched below a light, and the editor was in another room because there just wasn't room for them. Right. We'd also, you can see the pile of books underneath that little end table next to the couch. That pile of books there is to cover all the stuff. You can sort of see a power strip sticking out, but there was a lot of stuff there. So we put those books there just to hide that. Um, we moved a lot of stuff around because people's houses are people's houses, and you want, and they're typically more cluttered in photographs than anybody really wants them to be. It that it feel... was completely natural. Yes, because everybody thinks their house looks like that. Right. Uh, and it does sometimes, but it's always just a little more cluttered in real life than anybody wants it to be. Uh, and she was very nice. Everybody should go buy her book. I haven't read it, but I'm sure it's excellent. <laughs> and there's an excellent photo of her. 
Thank so you. before we get to this uh, next image, I just I know a lot of folks have joined us. I just want to remi remind everyone we've got a couple of giveaways. Um, we've got um, Tony's giving away two free passes to his uh, seminar that he'll be doing at Photo Plus Expo here in New York next week. So if you're interested in grabbing one of those, feel free to tweet us at, at PhotoShelter. Uh, and also if you've got any questions, we're able to answer some of them as we go along here. Tony, uh, you've been really great about, about letting me jump in here. So as you have questions, also feel free to tweet those and we'll try to squeeze them in. Uh, but Tony, I'll let you continue. All right, so this is Michelle Park, who is a, she was at the time, I'm not sure if she still is, but she was a, a on-air anchor for New York One, which is a news channel in New York City. Um, she now is, I think, a TV host on various networks, sort of showing up in specials and, and specific different things. Uh, and I met her on an editorial shoot, and we just talked about doing more shoots together because it would be fun. Because... I'm a photographer and I like taking pictures. Hopefully most of you listening are photographers who enjoy taking pictures. Um, if you're a photographer that doesn't enjoy taking pictures, it might be worth considering doing something else. Um, but if you like taking pictures, you should try and take as many pictures as you can, as often as you can. So with Michelle Park, I had this idea for several years that I wanted to photograph somebody in a phone booth. And in New York City, at least in Manhattan, there are four phone booths. Only four. All the rest of them are gone. There are phone, there are payphone sort of stands, but the phone booths that enclose you on all four sides, there's only four. They're all on West End Avenue, if anybody wants to go find them. There's one at 66, and the others are up near 100, like around 100, 110. Um, the real question is, do the phones work? You know, I walked by this one just... Uh, yesterday or the day before and I saw somebody in it on the phone. Wow. So the phone booths do work. Uh, they don't have lights anymore. So part of my plan for this, if we go to the next slide, uh, part of my plan for this was knowing I needed to light it in some way. And because phone booths are very small, you can't put anything very big in there. So. I looked around, I tried to figure out what to, to use, and what I ultimately ended up using was a very small LED. So what I use now are these little Manfrotto LEDs that are, you can get, I don't know, two inches by four inches, something like that. They're very small, uh, but they're fairly bright, as you can see, and you can gaffer, gaffer tape or clamp them to the inside. So what I did here is I gaff tape, gaffer's tape is a sort of a cloth tape, a little like duct tape, but not quite as sticky. It won't rip off paint as, and it's uh, easier to remove. Uh, I gaff taped an LED to the inside of the phone booth so that you wouldn't see it. It wouldn't stick out into frame, but it would be bright enough to actually be useful. Um, so that's the light source here. And you can see it's a little bit hard of a light source because it's small, but because it's photographed at night, it feels natural to me. It feels like it could have been the actual light source in the phone booth if it hadn't been broken for 20 years or however long it's been broken. And this, uh, also to, in response to the question about tripod, was definitely on a tripod. A shot like this just wouldn't work uh, without a tripod unless you cranked up the ISO to something crazy. And even then, it's just, it's not great. But what also works, I think, with this photograph is you have the, I'm pointing with my mouse as if you guys can see. Uh, I've got a mouse. Imagine, imagine that I'm circling the little light on the right. Um, there we go. So that light, I think, balances out the shot really well. It gives it a sense of place. If it was just the phone booth at night, it might feel like it was a studio or something. And then if you see the reflection in the phone booth glass, that's the top of a cab, of a New York City cab. They have these ads on them. And that, I think, adds another layer of interest. So you have the light I brought in, the light that I planned on once I was there, framing it with that, with that light above the door on the right, and then just waiting patiently 
for the right reflection in the glass. So I might have been here 20 minutes and done 30 or 40 frames of this trying to get the right reflection in the glass because as soon as I saw that the glass was going to reflect what was on the street, I knew I wanted something good. It had to hit at the right spot. If it was something taller, it would block her face. If it was something uh, smaller, it wasn't going to be big enough. It really becomes something that where it's a little bit of serendipity and a little bit of patience. You see that something is going to work, and then you wait for that thing that will work to work. And Tony, with a shoot like this, are, are you using something like Capture One to see the images as you're getting them? Or are you only using that kind of thing when you're in studio? Uh, I occasionally use either Capture One or Lightroom. Um, I shoot with Sony cameras, and Capture One just with Capture One 8 now tethers natively with uh, Sony, so I'm starting to use Capture One more and more. Um, but I will use Capture One or sometimes Lightroom in studio, occasionally on location, but only really if there's a client with me in a shoot like this. Because this was just me and, and my subject, and I was on a tripod. This was, I was shooting, I think, from median in the street or across the street. Um, I'm trying to minimize my footprint, so I didn't have a laptop and I wasn't shooting tethered for this. But for other shoots, like the photograph of Julie Chu, most of what we did that day was tethered. Um, it just depends on the situation. It is always nice to see it big. You, you miss a lot when you don't shoot tethered. Just looking at the back of the screen, the, there's details that you're not going to see. And the back of the screen on every camera is an interna internally generated JPEG. So it's not really giving you the information that the raw file is going to have. Uh, I mean, it's obviously better than nothing. It's different than when you had to shoot film and just cross your fingers. <laughs> uh, but it's not, it's not as much information as you get with, with a laptop and a computer and the software. Uh, all right, so. This is my favorite. He's uh, he was a very good kid. So this <laughs> shot, this shot was part of the same campaign as the shoot for Julie Chu. It was, it was uh, I shot the first photograph and they were really happy with it. And they said, you know, you should shoot the rest of this. And I said, yes, I should. So make sure you you make your client happy because you never know what they had in mind that you had no idea about. So. Because they were happy with the shot of Julie Chu in that shoot, I ended up shooting this and uh, three other kids doing various sporting things. Um, knowing that it had to match the photo I had done of Julie Chu, I also lit this with fluorescent banks, but with the addition of strobe. So if you if you look there, you can see that I had the two fluorescent banks on the right, and then I had a monolite bounced into the ceiling as a fill. Uh, because it's a bigger set and I just wanted more light, but I wanted it to feel similar to the previous shot. And if I had lit it completely differently, you can make any light look like any other light if you really, really want to, or you can just use the same lights and it's easier. And in general, the simple answer is often the right answer. Um, Making things complicated just to make them complicated it takes time. It, it lends uh, the possibility that something is going to go wrong, and it just complications lead to complications. And also with this, they wanted a very shallow depth of field. They wanted the background to be a little bit soft and the foreground to be a little bit soft. And admittedly, it's a wide shot, so you're limited in how much you can do that. Uh, but you can a little. So this was shot at 2.8, which is wide open on the Zeiss 2470. Um, and this was actually tethered to, to Capture One, I believe, uh, with my Sony A99. Uh, excuse me. Um, so the two fluorescent banks on the left, on the, I'm sorry, on the right, uh, monolite on the left. The monolite had a little bit of uh, green filter. It had a tiny bit of plus green, either an eighth or a quarter because the fluorescent banks, even though they are theoretically daylight balanced, um, are a little bit green, the ones I have. What I use now instead of the fluorescent banks are one-by-one one LED panels that Manfrotto has, and those, the color is perfect. 
but at the time I didn't have those yet, and so I used the fluorescent bags. The LEDs are are awesome. Um, and then uh, this was retouched by a professional retoucher, uh, Cyan Jack in New York City did an excellent job, and it was part of, of a campaign. This was a studio that had three floors that were all decorated like different apartments, so you could go around and I want to shoot in this living room and that kitchen and that dining room. It was pretty great. Oh, Tony, what kind of light meter are you using for your shoots? Uh, I use a Gaussian Starlight 2, Got it. which is uh, I mean, it's a Gaussian light meter. It has a ambient, or I'm sorry, an instant light meter. It also has a built-in spot meter that can do, I think, two degrees and five degrees. Um, and that, you know, I rarely need a spot meter, but when I do, it's really nice to have that. All right. Your All famous right. jumping shots. My famous jumping shots. The previous webinar I did with you guys, we had that great picture of uh, jumping, and here it is again. So this is from a project I'm doing of sort of athletic women because I feel like there's a shortage of photographs of athletic women out there. There's lots and lots of photographs of athletic men but not a lot of photographs of athletic women for some reason. So I thought I should try and do my best to feel, fill that void. So this is a woman named Catherine Carrick, who's a fitness model and an actress. I found her with a casting online. Um, for anybody who's shooting and trying to do tests on your own or just personal projects, uh, I find casting online to be very useful. Uh, casting networks, I think I mentioned before, is free and I use it a lot. So Catherine and, uh, was the third person I photographed this day, but this was my fo favorite shot of all of the three of them. This is a park in New York City on the Hudson, or on the East River. And you can see it's bright daylight. So if we go to the next slide, so it's bright daylight. Uh, I don't have a note as to what the daylight exposure was, but it was probably pretty close to sunny 16 on the highlight side. What we're doing here is I'm shooting into her shadow side. So if if it wasn't lit, she would be very, very dark. The background would be properly exposed and she would be extremely dark, uh, almost a silhouette. But uh, I used the Elinchrom Ranger Quadra RX and a Rotolux softbox, the 90 by 110 in centimeters, not inches, because that would be huge. Um, <laughs> to fill in the shadow side. So when you're shooting outside and it's bright sunlight, you can, with a battery-powered strobe like this one, if you want to, you can try and overpower the direct sunlight, and you can, but it's gonna take a lot of power. And the higher your power, uh, in general, the, the lower your flash duration, which is the, the speed with which it exposes, um, and the longer the recycle time and sometimes it just limits what you can do visually. But with this, if you just allow them to be backlit by the sun and light the, sh the shadow side, uh, it can work really well, uh, which, so that's, which is what I did here. So it's 200th of a second at 5.6, uh, ISO 100. Apparently I like to zoom to 35 millimeter. I noticed when I was making these lighting diagrams that I had lots of the 2470 at 35. It makes me think I should just buy a fixed 35. Um, although that is a great lens, the 24-7. So the softbox is to the left, 90 by 100. It's, it's sort of a medium-ish softbox. But it's doing, with a combination of the strobe, freezing the motion, and the 200th of a second, it's doing a pretty good job of freezing her motion. There's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of blur in her fingers, uh, but that is from the fact that I'm limited to a 200th of a second. The strobe would have frozen that, but the daylight, because you're limited by the flash sync of your camera, um, I didn't like want to go above 200. You can, with some cameras, go up to 250 or even higher, depending on if you have a leaf shutter or the camera and the strobe. But I start getting nervous. The, the Sony, I think, will go to 250, but I don't like to max it out because it just makes me nervous with every camera. I like to go one down from whatever the maximum is that they tell you you can do. 
just to be safe. Um, and I think it worked really well. It's uh, it's just a fun shot. And you can see her left leg is in shadow, so that gives you an idea of how, kind of how dark it would have been if she wasn't lit. It would have been darker than that because some of that's a light wrapping around, but it gives you an idea. And again, that, that backlight and then the strobe on the shadow side works, I think, fantastically well. Yeah, this is a great shot. And she just, I mean, look at that smile. She just looks happy. She, she just, just finished a race. She's not sweating at all. That's <laughs> it must have been a short race. That's right. All right. So um, we got a couple of questions about, and I think you've spoken to it a little bit, uh, but what is, what is some of the lighting equipment other than your gray card that you cannot live without? Um, this, the Elinchrom Ranger Quadra RX is awesome. It is, it is fantastic. It's, uh, it's limited to about 400 watts, I think. Um, but honestly, I also have the Ranger that's the 1100 watt Ranger. And I don't ever really use all of those watts unless you're doing direct sun with a big modifier. The 400 watts into a shadow side is plenty. And because it's smaller, it's a lithium battery, it packs up really small. I have a, a Manfrotto backpack that I can put the Quadra with an extra battery and the adapter for the Rotolux stuff and a camera and two lenses all in one backpack. And that's, it's just so nice to be that portable. It's got, yeah, it comes, yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that's hard to come by. Yeah, it's... You know, the old stuff for years, all the battery stuff was lead-acid batteries, and it weighed a ton. And, you know, you used it because that was your option, and it was better than bringing a generator or, you know, 6,000 feet of extension cord. But what's available now, especially that Quadra, is, is amazing. It's so nice. And the fact that it all fits in that Manfrotto backpack with the camera and everything, it's, it's awesome. I, I like it a lot. And then, in general, the... Uh, the Rotolux modifiers, those soft boxes uh, are beautiful. The first time I used, another one of my favorites is the medium, I don't remember what size it is. I think it's the 69 inch Rotolux Octobank. It comes with an interior baffle. And the first shoot I used that on, I was amazed at how beautiful that light was. The difference between a, a soft box or a bank. Um, or an Octobank that has an interior baffle and one that only has the diffusion on the outside, in terms of the quality of light, is it's really quite startling. I never, I knew it would be softer, but just the way that the light wraps around, the way the light behaves, the quality of the light is so much nicer. And all of the Rotolux boxes I have have that interior baffle. You can take it out if you want, but it's it's really nice. It's just such a nice light. Uh, and then I have uh, my second favorite lights are I have some Elinchrom ELC Pro HD monolights. Um, and those those are fantastic too. I have two thousands and two five hundreds. And the controls that those have and you can change it tells you what flash duration you're at at any power, which is really nice if you need to freeze motion. You can't really get into it because we only have five more minutes, but flash duration is extremely important and there's not enough attention paid to it. So knowing what flash duration you're at is a really nice. Anytime somebody, anything that involves movement, especially still lifes, if you're doing splashes and pours or things dropping, being able to freeze that motion is, is huge. And knowing what flash duration you're at allows so much more control. Uh, all right, so. So, yeah, one last photo here. So this is an actor named Shahid Hooper. Uh, this was photographed on the roof of the building that my office is in. I share an office with another photographer and a graphic designer because it's nice to get out of the house even when you're not shooting. And I felt like it would be fun to do some portraits on the roof. I'm lucky in that I have roof access in this office building. Uh, if anybody has ever seen any movie or television show that takes place in New York City, Everybody in those movies always has roof access and a good fire escape. But in the real world, most of the time they don't let you out there. So mm -hmm. it's nice. 
it's nice to be able to get out there. It feels like I'm actually in New York of, of film and television. So I put out a casting. I photographed, um, I think he was this fifth or sixth person this day. And then there was another day that I did five or six people. Um, just at various points on the roof because it just it's just a fun thing. And you've got control. You don't have to deal about deal with people walking by. You don't have to get permission to shoot somebody's space in their business or their apartment. Um, it just makes it very easy. And this was lit with that medium uh, Rotolux off the bank. Uh, I guess the 53 inch is the one I have. Um, that's four and a half feet. Yeah, 53 inch. But this was lit with the Ranger RX, which is the 1100 watt strobe. I wanted to have the ability to have a little bit more power. And I also, when I did the shoot, had two setups on the roof. Because I was doing several people, I just wanted it to be as simple as possible for me. So I had one softbox set up with the uh, Quadra, and then it, the Octabank with the Ellen Chrome Ranger. Triggering it with the, the Ellen Chrome radios. And then shooting with the 8514, this nice 8514, which is a beautiful lens. Uh, so the light is off to the left. You can see that it, the way it wraps around, hopefully you're all on monitors that are good enough that you can see the color and the quality of light is really nice the way it wraps around. And then the background has some daylight. You can see sort of reflection of windows on the building behind them. There's highlights sort of around those air conditioners. That's the sunlight sort of setting behind and bouncing off uh, windows on a building across the street, then creating that. And then you can see on the shadow side how dark it would have been if I hadn't lit it. But that balance where the building is is bright enough that you can see it, but it's it fades back a little so that the attention is on him. The sky is a little bright, but it's but there's tone there. It's not white. All of that you're you can control by bringing that strobe up there. Um, and again, shot with my A99, and that's IC8514 is a beautiful lens. Um, All right. Um, this is great, Tony. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, we're, we're just about at 5 o'clock here, so we're not going to take any more questions, but hopefully we got to answer a lot of them coming through. There were some really good ones. Um, Although, so, if, if, people oh, want to, if people want to post questions to my Facebook page that you see on the next one, I will do my best to answer them. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so you can find Tony. At I feel like it's like a Where's Waldo. Find Tony at TonyGale.com uh, on Twitter at Tony Gale or on his Facebook page there, Tony Gale Photography. So yeah, Tony, that would be great if, if folks have questions to to shoot them Tony's way. Uh, just as a, another couple of reminders, we've got Manfrotto's special offer, which is free shipping for the folks on the webinar today uh, using code free ship fourteen save you some money there. And uh, the photo shelter offer for 30 days free, we've got going also uh, using the, uh, the code, sorry, uh, get started, all one word. And then, not to waste any more time with all of my reminders, we've got two winners. Thanks so much to everyone who tweeted in to enter to win the passes to Photo Plus in Tony's presentation there. Our two winners are Joshua Levy and Connie Kennedy. So Joshua and Connie, we will be reaching out to you separately to make sure you get those passes. And we hope you, uh, you enjoy it and get to learn even more. Uh, Tony, how long is that workshop that you're doing? Uh, it's several, I think four or five hours. It's, it's a, a really good work where you get to cycle through different photographers. And you'll get exposed to different people like Lindsay Adler and others. You'll spend, I think it's 45 minutes or an hour with them, and then you'll rotate to the next person and then to the next person. Awesome. Uh, and, and you'll get to listen to me in between. Uh, I believe there's giveaways. Uh, there will be questions. It, it should be a really, really good program. Yeah, it sounds great. So if, for all those who entered and did not win, you can still check it out. I'm sure uh, I just go to PDN website or the Photo Plus Expo website and you can check check it all out there. And then we've got a, a couple of upcoming speaking events uh, that we already mentioned um, at uh, during PPE, which is the big photo festival coming up here in New York. Uh, Tony will be at the Manfrotto booth on the 30th, which is Thursday. 
He'll be at Adorama on the 27th. Wow, you're busy, Tony. And then yeah, he'll that be, week is busy. <laughs> it's a crazy week for everyone. And then on Saturday, the 1st, he'll be at the PDM30 panel. So if you want to hear more from Tony, feel free to check out those events. Uh, and with that, we will, it's 5.01, we will go ahead and sign off. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, the webinar will be available in another day or two to listen to on demand. Thanks, Thanks everybody.